put up your Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4 will be our text for study this morning. Look at the example of Jesus and His attitude towards Scripture. A lot of times people don't understand how important it is for us to read and study our Bibles. There just seems to be a de-emphasis on uh, personal study, uh, spiritual growth and development. And yet Jesus, being our perfect example, uh, gives uh, for us in this particular text uh, a number of great lessons as to why it is so important for us to spend time uh, reading and studying our, our Bibles. This is oftentimes referred to as the temptation of Christ, and, uh, and that is certainly true that there are three uh, temptations in this text. We would be mistaken if we thought this was the only time that Jesus was ever tempted. Uh, we talked about His temptation in general in Hebrews 4 and verse 6. But the Bible says He was tempted in every point like as we are, yet without sin. The Bible says there are three general areas wherein men uh, fall by the wayside. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. And I think it's safe to say that all three of those are found in these three temptations. But this is not the only time Jesus was tempted. This it, and it wasn't even the first time that Jesus was tempted. This is, just a, this is just an account of a particular and special time uh, whereby Jesus was tempted uh, insofar as it involved a direct, uh, a direct inter, uh, 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 interchange or exchange with uh, the devil himself. Now in Matthew chapter uh, 4, and beginning in verse 11, the Bible says, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He had fasted forty days and forty nights, who was afterward hungry. The tempter came to him and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. He answered him and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city and set him on a pinnacle of the temple and said if you are the son of God cast yourself down for it is written he shall give his angels charge concerning you and in your in their hands they shall bear you up lest at any time you dash your foot against the stone Jesus answered and said it is written again thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God then the devil took him up into an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and said to him, All these things I will give unto thee, if you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus said, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, that thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and there appeared unto him angels who ministered to him. Luke's account of this says the devil left him for a season, which means what? He came back. <laughs> when the season was passed, he came back. So that's why I made mention of the fact that this is not the only time Jesus was tempted. And it's not the only time that Jesus, I think, was tempted uh, in a very direct way by the devil himself. But as we think about, as we think about this, uh, this particular text, I want to draw your attention to a word that you, might, that you might not consider in the overall scheme of this. And that's the very first word of verse 1. What's the very first word in verse 1? Then, then, in other words, then refers to a specific point in time. In other words, there is a, there is a relationship. This word indicates there is a relationship. And in fact, in this case, it means there is a relationship between what you're about to read and what you have just read. Now, what have we, well, obviously we didn't read it, but... What is in the immediate context of Matthew 4, verse 1? And that would be Matthew 3, verses 13 to 17. And the account of the baptism of Jesus by John the Baptist. And this would mark, uh, this would mark the beginning of the public declaration of Jesus as the Son of God and His ministry. And so, and so I think it's important for us to remember this and to consider this. And that is this. That 
God made a public declaration that Jesus was His Son. And that He was pleased with what Jesus was doing. And immediately following that, that public, or when I say stepping into the spotlight, so to speak, then we have chapter 4. What do I learn from this? I learned if I am not a Christian, I learned that the minute that I decide I want to be a Christian and act on and act on that and act on that uh, that thought and that intent and become a Christian, the devil has immediately put me in his crosshairs. A lot of people are mistaken when they they have this idea that when I become a Christian. My life is going to get better in every single way. Now, look, when you become a Christian, your life becomes better. I mean, you enjoy the, I mean, you enjoy the forgiveness of sin. You, you enjoy the provision of prayer. Uh, you enjoy uh, the, the mediation of Christ, the intercession of the Holy Spirit. There are a lot of ways that your life gets better. Uh, I think about it, there's a couple at church that I love dearly. And, uh, and, uh, and they had been married for over 20 years, had dated years and years, married over 20 years. She was a faithful Christian. And he was not a Christian at all. And all you have to do is ask him, did your life get better after you obeyed the Gospel? And the man, Yes, it did. Did your marriage get better after you obeyed? Yes, it did. You know, there are so many, so many ways that your life will get better. But there are other ways in which it will be worse. Because the devil does not want you to serve the Lord. And he's going to do everything that he can to stop you from serving the Lord. And in this particular case, Jesus is about to begin his public ministry. And what's the easiest way, what was, what was the easiest and most effective way to derail God's plans for Jesus? And that would be to get Jesus to sin. Note, if the devil could get Jesus to sin at the very beginning then the whole thing becomes worthless, right? And so, it, and it's always easier to stop a thing early on than it is to stop it later on. Isn't that right? It's always easier to stop early on uh, than, than later on. You know, once you can see the finish line, it's always easier to finish. Isn't that right? And so, and so with that in mind, the devil wants to try to get a hold of Jesus as early as he can. The minute he begins his public ministry, the devil's going to work on him to try to derail the whole thing. And when you become a Christian, you need to understand the devil's put you in his crosshairs. Alright? Because he knows it'll be easier for him to get you off of the right way early on than to let you taste the goodness of God and experience the goodness of God and live in the goodness of God and, 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 and put your feet you know, firmly planted on that rock it's easier to get you to knock you off that rock now than it is later. And the same would go for any person who is a child of God who is not living the way they ought to. When you determine that you're going to live in the way that God wants you to live, again, the devil is going to put you in his crosshairs. Because if you're a lukewarm Christian, the devil's already got you. If you're a lukewarm Christian, the devil's got you right where he wants you. He doesn't have to do a thing. But you start wanting to live right and do right, then he's going he's to focus his attention on you. So I'm just giving you a word of warning. Yes. When you want to do right, the devil's going to put you in his crosshairs. But let me tell you this. The, the Lord will help you. He'll help you. He'll give you everything you need to, to combat the devil. And then you have that great promise of eternal life and an eternal home uh, in heaven that helps you, that helps you, uh, move forward and keep your eyes always on the prize. And so we learn that, that there's a whole lot more to this than just Jesus being tempted. The whole plan of God from all eternity was in danger, so to speak, of being derailed at the very, at the very beginning. And then I want to note this also just by way of introduction. What was Jesus' response when He was tempted? He used the Scriptures. And that's why it's important for us to know the Scripture. And not only that, Jesus had the right Scripture in hand that He needed at the appropriate time. For example, you know, in, in a time of temptation, I could respond with, Jesus wept. 
And that'd be Scripture, right? It's right there in John 11, 35. But Jesus wept is probably not the Scripture that I need to deal with whatever temptation is facing me at that particular point in time. In other words, I need the right Scripture at the right time. I need the right weapon in my hand when I when I want to when I want to deal with the devil. You know, you, know, you don't go bear hunting, you know, with a with a red rider BB gun. You know, you gotta have you gotta have the right weapon and, and you don't go rabbit hunting with a bazooka. You know, you've got you've got to have the weapon that is necessary and appropriate. At the time in which, you know, there may be a time when you need a red rider. Like when your neighbor's dog's in the yard. You know, you just want to give him a little encouragement to go somewhere else. You know, but, but, that ain't, you know, but that's not always the weapon, that's not always the weapon of choice or necessity. So we want to be, we want to know the Bible. We want to study the Bible. So that when those temptations do come up, I've got the right, I've got the right verse at the right time to deal with the situation uh, that that, I, that I'm facing. And so that's why it's so important for us to know the Bible. Jesus used the Bible to, to deal with the devil when, when the t- time of temptation came. Now, why would why would Jesus why would Jesus use the Bible? In other words, why not use why not use his feelings? Boy, we live in a feelings-driven society, don't we? You know, people don't even know the difference nowadays between what they feel and what they believe and what they think. You know, those are three totally different things, right? You know, our emotions, our emotions are not the same thing as our beliefs. But many people are just driven by their emotions. Now, why why is you know why did Jesus not allow his emotions to to determine what he was going to do. Well, Jeremiah says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, and who can know it? So my, my heart or my feelings are not a good, that's not a good source when I'm dealing, uh, when I'm dealing with the devil. The Bible says, he who trusts in his own heart is a fool, but whoever walks wisely will be delivered, Proverbs 28. And verse 26. So I'm glad Jesus didn't. I'm glad Jesus didn't use his feelings. I'm glad because using my feelings would be a bad source of, of strength and help. I'm glad Jesus didn't appeal to his deity. You no, know, Jesus. Bible said Jesus is God. He's both God and man. Don't ask me to explain it. The Bible just teaches it, and I believe. It. I mean, that, that's that's the best I can do for you on, on the dual nature of Jesus. The Bible says he's God and man. And I'm glad he didn't appeal to his deity side. You know, because the Bible says God cannot be tempted with sin, neither does he tempt any man. And and yet Jesus was tempted. So that shows the man side. But I'm glad he didn't say, well, you, now you know, devil, I made you. <laughs> you know, I've known you since the day that I made you. And I know what you're all about. And, and, and you know who I am. And I know who you are. So you just need to ski down along and, 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 go, and go somewhere else. Well, I'm glad he didn't do that. Yeah, because I don't get to talk to the devil like that. I don't get to tell the devil, now I know who you are from the day I made you. So I'm glad he didn't do that. That wouldn't be a very good example. And then number three, I'm glad he didn't give in. <laughs> because if he'd have given in, he couldn't be a Savior. If he'd have given in, he'd have needed a Savior. And a man that needs a Savior can't be a Savior. So I'm glad, I'm, glad, I'm glad that he did exactly what he did. And that is use the Bible. You know why? Because I can do that. I can do that. I can have the scripture at hand that I need in time of temptation. So that's just another example whereby Jesus is our perfect example. But now let's look at why Jesus used the scripture. In other words, what were his attitudes? I want to look at four attitudes that are found in our text. Four attitudes toward the Scripture revealed in this text that serve as examples for us as to why we need to have a proper attitude toward the Scripture. And the first is this, that Jesus believed that the Scripture was concrete. It's concrete. Now we know what concrete is, right? It's set. And when concrete's set, it doesn't change. Isn't that right? I mean, I, I reckon this floor is concrete. It's a slab. 
When it's poured and it's set, it does not change. When Jesus said three times, verse 4, verse 7, verse 10, it is written. It is written. It wasn't written in pencil. It, you can't erase it. You can't blot it out. She's there. It is written. In other words, Jesus said, it was written, and it's still written. Just as, by the way, we come back here, Lord willing, in 50 years, this floor will still be here. Still be, it'll be exactly like, now might have a new carpet on it, but the floor itself will still be the same, right? It's poured, it's going to stay poured. The Word of God is just like that. Now, too many people think the Word of God is fluid and not fixed. In other words, they think they can take the Word of God and, 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 and mold the Word of God to fit whatever society that they're in. You know, kind of like pouring water out of a, out of a, out of a, uh, uh, of a, of a coffee mug uh, into, a, into a goblet. You know, the water just takes the shape of whatever container that it's in. And people try to take the Bible. And, and I'm going to pour it in this cup over here. But now over here, this won't work. So I'm going to pour it in a different cup over here. Now that's the wrong answer. The Bible, the Bible is not to be changed depending on where we are in society. Society is supposed to be changed wherever it, it is found to be inconsistent with the Bible. In other words, the Bible is given to change society, not society to change the Bible. Now let me, let me just add this. I, didn't need, I wasn't even thinking about saying this until I was driving up uh, yesterday. And that is this. I sincerely believe that the church of Christ has something to offer the world that no other religious body has to offer the world. And that is this. The Word of God doesn't change. The Word of God doesn't change. In other words, what? Listen, if, if I were able to live a hundred years I'm going to preach, I'm going to, and I'm preaching the Bible. I'm preaching the same plan of salvation in a hundred years that I'm preaching today. If, if I'm talking about the organization of the church, I'm preaching the same organization in a hundred. But it's not been, this is 2,000 years old. The plan of salvation that I will preach today is the same one the apostles preached on the day of Pentecost. It'll be the same one that Paul preached in His ministry. It'll be the same one that all faithful proclaimers of truth have preached for the last 2,000 years. We live in a society that is has lost its ever-loving mind. There is, there is no, there are no moorings anymore. Our society is not tied to anything. It's not anchored to anything. And we have something to offer the world that nobody else does. And that is the unchanging Word of God. We need to, we need, and, and, I, don't, and I use this word intentionally and without apology. We need to market ourselves to the world as a group that believes in truth. Something that, we've got something here that you can get a hold of and know it's true and live the rest of your life based on it, knowing that it is not going to change. How many people are looking for truth in the world today? You know, you know, when, you, when we've got so many people saying that, that men can get pregnant, and, and by the way, religious institutions are buying into that foolishness. We have something nobody else has to offer. We need, and we need, again, we need to present ourselves to the world as a, as a group of people that, that stand on the unchanging, eternal Word of God. There are people that are looking for that. There are people in religious institutions that are looking for that. They see the changes that are taking place in, in the church of their grandparents or the church of their parents. And it's not the same church that it used to be. But the Bible hasn't changed. The Bible hasn't changed. And so, and so we have something to offer. If we'll just get out there and offer it to people. Let them, let them know what we've got. And, 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 and understand. Look, look, I understand. Jesus understands. It's not going to appeal to everybody. 
It's not going to appeal to everybody. It didn't appeal to everybody when Jesus preached it. It didn't appeal to everybody when the apostles preached it. And it ain't going to appeal to everybody today. But there are people out there that it does appeal to, but they just don't know where to find it. We've got to get out there and help them and help them find it. The Scriptures, Jesus believed the Scriptures were concrete. That is, they're fixed and not fluid. Secondly, Jesus believed that the Scriptures were authoritative. If we were going to use the theological terminology, we'd say it's canonical. The canon. The body of, the body of Scripture. The body of truth. No, it's, it's authoritative. Jesus says it's authoritative because it came from the mouth of God. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. He believed that the Scriptures were authoritative because they came from the mouth of God. In my Bible, I guess in my old King James Bible, 857 times, 857 times in my Bible, it says, Thus saith the Lord, or saith the Lord. 257 times it says, the Word of the Lord. Now, I don't know about how you do math in Tennessee, but in Alabama, that's about 1,100 times. 1,100 times, thus saith the Lord, saith the Lord, the Word of the Lord. My Bible is 1,148 pages long. You know what that means? That means for every page in my Bible, there is a thus saith the Lord. His Word is on every page of my Bible. It's authoritative. It came from God's mouth. And because it's authoritative, I'm not free to pick and choose what parts of it I want to believe. Now so many people, so many people, treat the Bible like they're going to Morrison's cafeteria. They walk down the line and they say, oh, that looks good. I'm going to take me some of that. Ah, oh, but I don't want them Brussels sprouts. Now, I'd never say I don't want them Brussels sprouts, but some people might. And they just pick and choose what they like on the buffet, and they take that, and they leave the rest for somebody else. And they'll say, look, if you like it, that's fine for you. I don't like it. So therefore, I, that's not how the Word of God works. It's all the Word of God. It's all the Word of God. And I'm, and I'm obligated. I'm obligated to obey every, every bit of it. And so it's authoritative. So it's, it, it's fixed. It's authoritative. But then, number three, Jesus believed the Scriptures were consistent. Now when the devil says, the devil took him up into a holy city, set him on a pinnacle in the temple, and said, if you are the Son of God, cast yourself down. Now, did you hear what the devil did? Quoted the Bible. Cast yourself down, for it is written. And then proceeded to quote Psalm 91, 11 and 12, verbatim, without any mistakes. The devil can quote the Bible. It's not like Genesis chapter 3 where de the devil said almost what God said. God said, thou shalt surely die. And the devil said all that. He just added one little old word to it. He just said, thou shalt surely not die. He said everything that God said just added a little to it. Not in this case. He quoted the Bible verbatim. He shall give His angels charge concerning you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest at any time you dash your foot against a stone. The devil not only knew the Scriptures, he knew who that Scripture applied to. That don't apply to me. <laughs> you throw me off the temple and I'm a dead man. <laughs> Ain't no angels going to swoop down and gather me up. The devil knows he knew the Scripture, he knew who it applied to, but he misapplied it. Jesus said, it is written again. Literally, that means in another place. Now, here's what Jesus is saying. He said, now, now, you've quoted the Bible. And you've quoted it accurately. But you've misapplied it. Or, uh, he said, you've applied it in such a way that cannot be reconciled with, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. 
And that's another problem people have with the Bible. Is that they, they apply the Bible in ways that contradict other clear Bible statements. He quoted it. He quoted it accurately. He knew who it applied to, but he misapplied it. The Bible's consistent. Uh, what it teaches, you know, what it teaches in Jonesboro, Tennessee, is what it teaches in Timbuktu. It teaches the same thing everywhere, and it doesn't contradict itself. If the Bible ever contradicts itself, it can't be the Word of God. It's just that simple. It's just that simple. And so we think about we think about, for example, all of the religious division. All the religious division that exists in the world today. People that are in religious error can generally find a passage of Scripture that they think defends their position. The problem is their application of it cannot be reconciled with another passage of Scripture. And that means their application of the Scripture is not consistent. It's not consistent. Uh, for example... Uh, I believe it was uh, I believe it was Martin Luther in his commentary on Romans, where it says, "Seeing that we are justified by faith," and then out in the margin note, he wrote the word "sola," S-O-L-A, Latin for only. The Bible doesn't teach faith only. It didn't teach faith only in Romans five verse one, but Martin Luther wanted it to teach faith only, so he. Assumed that that's what it taught. Except for the fact that James 2.24 says that man is justified by works and not by faith only. Now, that passage was so problematic for Luther that he, he literally, he literally disparaged the Word of God and called James an epistle of straw. In other words, because he knew. It, 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 think about this. Isn't it interesting how so many people that teach faith only today think they can reconcile James 2.24 with salvation by faith only when the man who invented it knew that he couldn't do it. Now, have you ever thought about that? It's like, a, I believe it was, a, I can't remember which, uh, which uh, lecture it was uh, back in the 1800s. I heard, uh, heard a sermon by B.C. Good Pastor, and, uh, and it might have been William Jennings Bryan that made the statement. But somebody, somebody made the statement that said, I know how to reconcile Genesis chapter 1 with Darwin's theory of evolution. And the immediate response was that, well, then you're a better man than Darwin because Darwin couldn't do it. No, Darwin knew his, his theory couldn't be reconciled with Genesis chapter 1, but somebody 50 years down the road figured out what Darwin could. That's like, how do people who teach faith only think they're smart enough to reconcile that doctrine with James 2.24 when the man who invented the doctrine of faith only couldn't hit, himself could not do it. Don't you think he'd have figured out how to do it? No. He just decided that James what, what wasn't an epistle of any consequence. But the Scripture's consistent. It doesn't teach faith only in one verse and not by faith only in another verse. Look, ain't nobody on the planet believes in salvation by faith more than me. You might believe it as much as me, but you can't believe it more. <laughs> I believe in salvation by faith as much as anybody living. But I do not believe in salvation by faith only. And you cannot you cannot reconcile you cannot reconcile those two things. The scriptures are consistent. You know, Paul said. Uh, of what he taught, he says, as I teach everywhere in every church. 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 17. 1 Timothy 2.2. 2. The things that you have heard and learned from me, the same 
commit to faithful men that they may be able to teach others also. No, what Paul taught is what Timothy taught is what the faithful men taught and that's what the others also were taught and believed. It was the same thing. The Scriptures are consistent. And then lastly this. Jesus believed that the Scriptures could be comprehended. It amazes me again how many people think that we all can't understand the Bible. All understanding the light means that the author is deficient. Now look, I've written some things in 30 years of preaching. I've written some things that I went back and I thought to myself, what in the world does that mean? What was going through my mind when I, when I wrote that? Right? And so if somebody got confused, it's not their fault. <laughs> Whose fault? It's my fault. It's my fault. But if the Bible is given to us by God and men don't understand it, it's not God's fault. It's man's fault. And the Bible is given to us to be comprehended. God expects us, we sometimes like, God expects us to use our noodle in order to understand His words. For example, and again, go to the text. All these things I will give you if you'll fall down and worship me. It is written, man shall, you shall worship the Lord thy God and Him only shalt thou serve. But he, now here's the kicker. The word only is not in the Old Testament text. It just says, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and Him shalt thou serve. Jesus added the word only. Why? Because it's implied. It's implied only. You know, when God said, you know, when God said worship me, he meant worship me and only me. Only me. And so Jesus used what we would call inference. In other words, the, the, the ability, the ability to know a thing without being express, explicitly told that thing. Right, let, let me explain to you how inference works. It's like taking two sets, taking two pieces of truth and drawing a conclusion without being told the conclusion. All right, you ready for this? My knife is in my right hand. Okay? My knife is in my right hand. My right hand is in my right front pocket. Where's my knife? Don't say in my hand. I already told you that. Where's my knife? What? It's in my right front pocket. Not my left front pocket. Not even one of my, my left rear or right rear pocket. Did I tell you that my knife was in my right front pocket? Expressly? No. I told you two things you needed to know. My knife is in my right hand and my right hand is in my right front pocket. And you correctly deduce that my knife is in my right front pocket. And you know that with 100% certainty, don't you? No, it's a logical and reasonable conclusion to draw. That's how, that's how inference works. That God gives us a certain amount of information, and it's up to us to gather that information, and then put it together in a, in a logical and consistent way by which we can draw conclusions that we know are good and right. And we can and we can hold over to those things. It's like I mentioned in Bible class. You never find all the plan of salvation in a single spot in the book of Acts. But you can read about all the things the Bible says you gotta do to be saved. You gotta hear the word of God to be saved. You gotta believe the word of God to be saved. You gotta believe in Jesus Christ to be saved. You gotta repent of your sins to be saved. You gotta confess Jesus to be saved. You gotta be baptized to be saved. You gotta continue to live in faith in order to be saved. The Bible says all of those things. And then when you think about it, there's only one way that those things can be put in order. There, there's no reasonable order other than other than you gotta hear the word of God to be saved. You gotta believe in the word of God in Christ to be saved. You gotta repent of your sins based on that faith. Because repentance is a change of mind that leads to a change of living. You don't change your mind unless you believe that you have to change your mind. So repentance has to follow faith. Repentance doesn't precede faith. 
It follows faith. And then you wouldn't confess that Jesus is the Son of God unless you intended to repent. <laughs> and so, so that's the only way that goes. And then the Bible says that baptism is the means by which we contact the blood of Jesus, have remission of sins, forgiveness of sins, wash our sins away. So there's only in those, there's no other way to put that recipe together. Now, I, sometimes I like to call it a recipe, and here's why. We all know, you know, we all know about how recipes work, right? I mean, there's a and there's an order in which everything's got to be done, right? You know, some ingredients have to be mixed first, some second. Sometimes, you know, sometimes things have to go in the oven for a little while, and then something else is added to it, right? But if you, for example, you know, if you if you if you beat those eggs and then cook them at 400 degrees for 20 minutes and then add the flour to it, you're not gonna get a cake, right? No, you got in order to get that cake, you got to put that thing in order, right? You got to get the eggs and then the flour and whatever goes into it. Then you, you know, all the, you know, all those things have to be done in the proper order to get the proper result. And the plan of salvation is the same way. You can't believe that you're saved before you're baptized, because the Bible doesn't teach that. So if you get if you get the remission of sins and baptism out of order. You've not, you've not, you've got, you don't have the right result. If you think that a person repents before they have faith, you've got the wrong order. If you think that you confess that you're saved before you're baptized, you, know, you, you make the confession, I believe that God has for Christ's sake forgiven me of my sins, and then you're baptized, the order is wrong. You know, you got to get, you got to get things in order for them to be right. The plan of salvation is one of those things. And though, look, anybody can understand that. Any accountable person can understand that. And God expects us to understand that. God didn't give us any liberty to change the recipe. It's got to be done. It's got to be done God's way, the way that God said to do it. It's comprehensible. So when Jesus told the devil, only serve God, only serve God, he expected that the devil understood that. He understood that. By the way, did you, did you notice what the devil didn't say? The devil didn't say, well, that's just your opinion. <laughs> well, it gets tired of hearing that. Oh, that, well, Jesus, that's just your interpretation. Even the devil's got more sense than to do that, right? Even the devil's got enough sense, more sense enough to say, well, Jesus, that's just your interpretation. Jesus' interpretation was right. And look, there has to be a right interpretation. There has to be. You know, when, uh, when, uh, uh, you know, when Jesus asked the man a question and he answered the question, you know, uh, which man... Did he love him the most? He said, "Well, the man that he, for, he forgave the most." Jesus said, "You have rightly answered. You rightly answered." In other words, there was a wrong answer to that question, <laughs> but he got the right answer. And so there are things that are good and right and proper that we can know are good and right and proper. We can know it. We can know it. It's comprehensible. So the scriptures are fixed. They're authoritative. They're consistent. And we'll just say this, they're knowable. They're, they're knowable. And Jesus believed that about the Scripture. And that's what we've got to believe about the Scripture. Yes. And if we do believe that about the Scripture, we'll spend our time reading the Scripture and studying the Scripture. Rather than just setting aside and carrying it in a leather bound in a leather bound book to church on Sundays and Wednesdays. So Jesus gives us a marvelous example of what our attitude toward the scriptures uh, must be. And we have set forth in, in this in this uh, particular uh, uh, study God's plan of salvation. And we've got to hear the word of God, Matthew 15:10. Hear and understand, Matthew 15:10. 
I've got to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. John 8, 24, except you believe that I am, you'll perish. We've got to repent of our sins. Jesus said if we don't repent, we'll perish. Luke 13, 3 and 5. Jesus said we've got to confess Him before men and be confessed before the Father who's in heaven, Matthew 10, 32 and 33. And we've got to be baptized, immersed in water in order to be saved. Jesus said he who believes and is baptized shall be saved, Mark 16 and verse uh, 16. And then, becoming children of God, we've got to live right. He that endures unto the end, the same shall be saved. Uh, Matthew 10, 22. Uh, be faithful unto death, I'll give you a crown of life. Revelation 2 uh, and verse number 10. So we've got to live and walk in the light. And as we do that, we enjoy the continual provisions of His blood. If we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. And the second law of pardon for the Christian is this. I've had people ask me this, and it's a valid question. If I have to be baptized to be forgiven of my sins, when I sin again, do I have to be baptized again? Do I have to be baptized again? And the answer to that question, no, no. God's given provisions for Christians to be forgiven. And that's in 1 John 1 and verse 9. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Simon the sorcerer was a Christian, and he sinned again. But Peter didn't drag him, or Philip didn't drag him back to the water. Peter didn't drag him to the water and say, "Now I've got to dunk you again because you've sinned again." He said, "Repent and pray. Repent and pray." That's the law of pardon for the Christian. And so, if you're here this morning and, and you need to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, we encourage you to do. To do what Jesus said. If you're a child of God and you need to, you need to live a, a more faithful, a holy, godly life and, and you sin in some way uh, that, that would necessitate or you believe would be helpful for you to make a confession of wrongdoing and let us pray with you and for you, then we encourage you to do that right now. Right now. We're going we're gonna, to uh, gather up. We're going to stand Jason's going to lead us in the song of encouragement just as I am. And we want you, if you need to obey the gospel or be restored to a relationship with God, we want you to come right now together we stand and sing this song.